Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at Earsports.com, a Paramount podcast. I am Mike Casazza here on Monday morning to dive into the mailbag again with Chris Anderson. Take some questions, attempt some answers. Chris, I have a feeling attempt to answer some question is probably the best way to put it today. There are always repeats in the mailbag, Mike, always. Um, that is the nature of this. You know, when you see what happens and people ask questions and most people see the same thing or something similar. This might be the most repetitive mailbag we've ever had because they all kind of center on one topic, which I'm sure we're going to get to. And it's the topic that if you're listening to this, you probably think it's going to be. All right. Well, since we might not spend a whole lot of time on the game or current events, let me just ask you real quick here. Having reviewed in whatever way you do, statistically watching the game, reading, maybe the whole enchilada. I feel any different about that game because there's there's two things that happen. You see two straight losses and you go, here we go again. This is going bad. Here come the torches and the pitchforks. Team is doomed. Any any one or number of those things. But you could also say, you know what, they had played good offense and ran into a white hot running back and lost on a Hail Mary and boy, they're really beat up. And you could rationalize some things too. And maybe that's healthy. Anything that you think needs to be more toward the surface right now, having given the game a second look, a second read, a second um, time under the microscope? Well, there's two things, and, and both of them were kind of uh, like were secondary or even tertiary questions in the mailbag from fans. So it, it is on the minds of a couple people. But one I've already talked about on the board, and I'll get to that in a second. And the other we'll talk about in a couple of minutes that I haven't discussed on the board, but was asked about. Have you seen, did you see my post about the snap counts and the depth for the second and third lines for the WV defense? Oh, uh, yeah. Somebody get Beanie Bishop an ice pack and some Advil. I think that that leads into because there was a question about this and oh man I, oh yeah WVU fan in DC how did the defensive depth get so bad and what does the current station situation say about the staff's ability to manage a roster because you and I discussed it on the post game pod because people were like yeah this is a great question was for the first time in years WVU is at eighty five scholarships full legitimate eighty five scholarships. And the depth is as bad as I can remember in the secondary um, and in the second and third lines of the defense here. How does that happen? Um, we can discuss that in a minute. But for those listening that haven't read, that aren't VIP members, didn't read this, um, I kind of went through those back six spots, two linebackers, two corners, two safeties, not counting the spear because they rotate that pretty well. And um, I've had to move things around. But you're basically talking those six guys are playing 90 plus percent of all the snaps on defense and playing special teams. Again, something we discussed in the post game pod. And I went back to this to make sure I wasn't exaggerating and actually check the numbers and make sure my eyes weren't lying to me. My eyes were not lying to me. Um, Burks, you know, 100% before, 97 per, before his injury, 97% in the game most recently. Wilson, 93%. Ruffin, 92%. Bishop, 100% of the defensive snaps since week three. Lathan was 94% before his injury. Ben Cutter's been 88% since. Koba, 90%. It's a lot of snaps. Those, that, that second and third line of the defense. And that's why it was something you brought up. I can't remember if I pregame or postgame you were talking about before, but it's when they get, they're not getting seven yards. These running backs, it was what you're talking about the runs for Gordon postgame because you're talking about how yeah. it went more than 10. Uh, on the the big plays for runs, but they didn't average 10. They averaged 30. And I think this is partly why, because you get past that first line of defense, you're getting to a second and third line of defense that is completely exhausted and can't tackle. Yeah, that's alarming. That's a huge number. Um, Again, Gordon did that. His rushing total, 55% of it came on runs of 15 yards or more, 75% of it. Camera runs at 15 yards or more on Saturday night and just just really, really good in that fourth quarter because they just targeted a really, really thin entire defense. And I don't know how that gets better. The thing that stands out to me is that I think your concern is that 
maybe teams have figured out things a little bit against West Virginia. I'm just going on what people who are familiar with the Mountaineers have told me. Use that for what you want, but probably fill in the blanks a little bit. And it it does kind of fit what's happening. And the one thing is that, like, they just don't change the pictures on defense. And if somebody finds something that's successful, they're going to keep doing it. And to hit all those home runs on just, like, split zone plays or just handoffs to Gordon, they were just doing the same thing over and over and over. And that's, that's concerning because that defense is just kind of what it is right now, too. Um, I, I have a feeling that we'll get into a lot of that stuff, but the good and the bad of West Virginia opponents seem to have solved. Like the the stuff that they say about Devin Carter, um, I talked to somebody who thought Horton was going to be a like a factor sooner than later. He is. Carter got him going. Offensive line misses rematch with what, what somebody told me. You could just kind of see all that stuff a little bit, but that's good. Defensively, people aren't as high on the team, and that's going to be like the the anvil around their ankles right now. How they're going to make this work? So. I'm sure we'll discuss all that at some point in the mailbag. Now that we set the table, are you ready to go? Yeah, let's get to it. Uh, it it's kind of related to something we've already talked about. I touched on it um, with the depth in the secondary or the second and third lines from WVU fan in DC. He asked, how did the defensive depth get so bad? Um, Mike, what, it, how did it happen? Because again, I, I had a hard time in the post game wrapping my head around this fact that West Virginia is at 85 scholarships for the first time in a while, but seems as thin as ever at some key spots. How do, how does this end up happening? All right. So I don't know if this is because he's not available and that makes him like 20% better. But the word is that like they really miss Trotter. Like Trotter was going to play and play a ton. So there's one linebacker. Lathan, two. Safeties, you don't have Cobb. Corner, you don't. Don't have Miller. And then I think that Hurd was Hurd was Hurd injured a little bit earlier on. And then I believe he had a death in the family too. So he's been slowed and hasn't really contributed. And now you're at a point with him, like, do you even play in the four games and cost him a redshirt year? And that's a guy they thought was going to be like a troublemaker in a good way on the edge there. But absent the defensive line, which has more bodies than ever, you're talking about missing a linebacker a corner and a safety, two linebackers, actually a corner and a safety and then corner and safety who were brought into play a linebacker who was recruited and was going to play. That's, that's a chunk there. That's like four parts of the defense and it's four players. And realistically, you know, how many players is West Virginia going to have on defense that that could be that valuable and lost and replaced. And also don't forget, you're not replacing one, you're replacing two. Cause as you saw with Lathan, you're replacing the starter and you're replacing the backup, and you got to make that work. And all of a sudden, Gyro Favoris is playing a little bit where he's maybe not supposed to be playing defense at all in college football. So those things do add up a little bit. Chris, do you think they'd be playing Montre Miller a bunch or Keyshawn Cobb a bunch? Uh, maybe you would see Trotter more, certainly too late the more. I just wonder if, if it's a quantity of snaps that couldn't be replaced. I, I don't think the injuries are like an exhaustive excuse here or an explanation even. I think they probably should have somebody who can fill in a couple more plays here and there at a at a replacement level. Yeah, I mean, injuries are a part of it. Like, There's no denying that, but that can't be the only excuse. And then it brings us back to – there's an, another angle here I'll get to in a second, but there was something else that, you know, that's a favorite of our message board, and that's Jags. Are there too many Jags on this team? For those listening that don't know what that is, it's just another guy. You know, when, when you go out and you recruit and you're trying to get guys, you're trying to get elite talent, top talent, contributors, difference makers. And and at times, you're ending up instead with Jags, just another guy, just a guy to fill a roster spot. And I don't know if there's – I mean, maybe there's some of that. because There's guys on this team – that you're looking at and you're like, well, they're on the roster. They're a scholarship player. They've been here for a couple of years. And yet you, you don't, you don't feel comfortable even putting them out there barely on special teams. Like that's not a good thing. That That's not, that's not a player you should have on your roster. I, th- I don't think like, you know, unless, you know, if somebody's in their second, third, fourth year of the program and they're, they can't contribute, that's not a good thing. Um, but they also wonder about the other part that I mentioned a second ago, the allocation of the scholarships, like how they're split up amongst, you know, the, the, the different position groups. And when I'm looking at this, like the corners and the, and the safeties, 
feel like it's light. Like there's 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 not enough scholarships being used on those positions. And maybe that's changing because for those anybody that follows recruiting, you know, West Virginia has a ton of defensive back commits right now and are still actively recruiting others as well. So maybe it's a deficiency that they've recognized and they're trying to change now. But then you start asking questions like, wait, you're going to bring in, you know, nine true freshmen in the secondary. How is that going to help next year? You'd be saving those spots for transfer. So I wonder about some of this management of scholarships and where they're going and who they're using them on to try to help out there. Talk Jags for a second. Because the candidates here are are not obvious, I think. There's maybe not too many. Um, Colby Spells, Andrew Wilson Lamp. Those would be your candidates at cornerback. They just don't have, like, I'm not going to. Right. Like, yeah. they should not be. Right. Um, right. And and eventually, like Wilson Lamp has to make that conversion from receiver to cornerback. That can't be um, part of the explanation anymore. Linebacker, they don't have Tyreek Austin Cave. That's another body that we forgot there. Um, and then they they kind of made themselves thin, or or chose to make themselves thin by moving Lance Dixon from Will to Spear. And Dixon, we obviously know his situation right now. So that's another body that's gone too. I forgot Austin Cave, and then Dixon. There's two more bodies that just aren't there. Defensive line, I don't know that you can put Jag on anybody right now because they're just they they have bodies there. They're not wanting bodies. They've done that okay. Where it gets interesting in the safety, Burks, Wilson, Floyd. You really can't hold it against Aiden Tagaloa Nelson or Josiah Jackson right now. Christian Stokes, maybe. Like they thought he was a deep safety. He's probably a spear now and he's not even getting on the field. Raleigh Collins. They've had different ideas for what to do with him. He's a spear who played a little bit, and actually they had to get him in the game in the fourth quarter, and he was on the field for one of the touchdowns and kind of came unglued. And that's your list of candidates. Is it that thin? And maybe you're right here that just by going over a small number, and that's that's a, a, a snapshot in time. It's not to say the Collins and Stokes, Spells, Wilson Lamp can't get it together, but in this year, nothing from those guys. That hurts. Would they be different, though, if, two, three, maybe all those guys were better off this year than they are. Probably. Stuff's why it's, it's a thin line back there. You don't have a lot. You just don't have a lot of room for error. And, and unfortunately, there's been some error. There's been some injuries. And it's just a combination of those three things. Everybody always asks, like, what's the one reason why this is happening? Well, there's three. You know, there's a little bit of jag uh, quotient here. There's a little bit of injury bad luck and then there's a little bit of just not having enough players to start with and you combine those three and and things get bad very fast very very fast let's see what was the next question was related to offense i got some stats here i'm gonna let you take it for a second while i refine these stats if you will but va mountaineer 15 wants to ask why is Neil Brown down by four points become an offensive genius, but Neil Brown up by four points turns into the most conservative play caller in the history of football? Old happens die hard. Probably the simplest explanation I can get is that he wants to fall into those like familiar grooves that you get into. Mike Gundy said after the game, it was pretty interesting, but you know Brown's a really smart coach. But if you look back at the history, he's about a two-thirds run guy. Um, that's an alarming number. But also, there's probably some nuance to that, too. Probably like in the normal course of games or in, in situations like where you can run it or not, they're going to run it. And if you look at some other data, West Virginia runs the ball more than the expectation, more than the situation calls for. More than about anybody in the country. I had to get the number in front of me, but it's like in the 130s. So you kind of know that's coming a little bit, but I think that you can do that to stay in the game or to work on a lead. And that's just like a synonym of this, like patient style with the play clock and all that stuff. And it works at times, but it worked when just a totally different part of the schedule. The running game, I think was very different earlier in the season. They didn't trust the passing game. And I think when you find a reason to get back into something that has worked, or at least feels good, you're going to do that and then just work with the other part of it, which would be your defense or the consequences of maybe not being effective. But man, if you watch him, like 
when they have to hurry or when they choose to hurry. And like sometimes they were hurrying into third downs or or second downs, Chris. And it was working because they were keeping the defense off balance. And obviously when they were down by the two scores that Houston, they played fast, that worked too. But they said they were going to inject that into the game plan. And they did against Oklahoma State. And when they picked their spots, it worked out pretty well. But also just like throwing the ball has been better the past couple of games. There's no doubt about that. But there's risk involved. And I think we're probably being dishonest with ourselves if we say that there is some concern about Green and his decision making in tight games. It could be up a little bit, could be down a little bit. One mistake could turn a small deficit into a larger one, could turn a small lead into a deficit. And just bad things typically don't happen when you hand the ball off. Here's your stats. This is another situation just like the snaps for the second and third line where my eyes told me something very similar to what you just said and to what was being asked about, about how the offense just changes. It just, just at least the success it has changes um, depending on the game situation. So I'm back and look, hold all the numbers. Uh, here are your passing stats for West Virginia when they are losing the game by any any margin at all. They are 53 for 98, 843 yards, six touchdowns, one interception with a QB rating of 145. Okay. You know, again, it's it's just, it's what you think it is. It's a low completion percentage with good distance on your passes. It's the Skylar Howard offense we keep referencing. Um, but when you turn to win and tied situations, 44 for 83, similar Um Completion percentage, very similar. I think it's within 1% for 575 yards. That means the yards per attempt and yards per completion is down uh, a couple yards. But then you have four touchdowns to three interceptions and a QB rating of 119. So a decrease in efficiency there, an increase in uh, mistakes when they're winning or when things are tied. But where they really, really big difference comes from is in the run game somehow. And I think part part of this is tied to Eric Green's ability to run with the ball. And he has been more often running when West Virginia is losing uh, and and getting chunk yards because these are the stats, non FCS edition. Okay. Not, not Duquesne. I'm not counting Duquesne in either of these situations, but West Virginia, when they run the ball, when they're losing, they're averaging 4.61 yards per carry and have 11 touchdowns. When West Virginia is winning or tied, they're averaging 2.9 yards per carry and have a single touchdown this season. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, can I go to the past? I, say, I don't know if the play calling changes. I don't, I, again, I, I don't haven't been charting the plays in that way, but the stats say West Virginia tightens up and has less success. The passing stats for a lead. Um, and again, that's what we're talking like. Maybe you're worried about green, uh, green through an interception down three, nothing against Oklahoma state. And then when was the interception against, they were down. No, they were winning against Houston through the interception, right? Close game there. I thought I want to say it was four. Yeah, points. I was gonna say according to CFB stats, he only has one interception when losing, and that was Saturday, three nothing. Yeah. Okay. Um, which would put the rest on Marchio. So maybe it's not a green thing. So that doesn't even work for that explanation either. Something something needs explaining there, for right. sure. Uh, next question, and I, I assure you, the forty-seven people. Out of the 50 questions asked that asked about Neil Brown's future, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, Schmalz 08 WVU asked, was full four and one fool's gold? Well, no, because they were losable games. Like they could have very easily lost that pick game with their quarterback situation. They could have lost to Texas Tech with their backup quarterback. They could have lost to TCU on the road. Like they lose those games in the past. I can't, you can't, um, you can take the banners down, but you still made the banners. You know, and they did some good things relative to the situation they were in, especially in those in those wins. So that's that's okay. Like they made it happen. And again, you play your schedule. You you just have to accept that sometimes. And like if if it gives you bad quarterbacks in a row, oh well. The trouble is that like it looks really bad. Like Pitt hasn't been good. 
and TCU and Texas Tech both got smacked on Saturday, so that doesn't look good either. Houston gave Houston probably has the best offense that West Virginia has seen so far. Might not even be probably, and gave Texas trouble. So yeah, like you said, Chris, like your eyes tell you something. It was hard to come away impressed offensively with that, but you could say, all right, the offense will come around. It was really hard to say that they were going to win games allowing. You you can win games allowing 6, 13, 21 points. How many games are you going to win scoring 17, 20, and 24? Well, guess what? 39 points, 34 points, loss, loss. Um, those are the second and third highest point totals for Brown against the FBS and their losses. Or excuse me, third and fourth and their losses. Um, he had never scored more points in back-to-back games. Last year, he scored 73 in the first two games and went 0-2 then. So... You know, is that fool's goal too? Is their defense maybe not as bad as it's looked? We, we kind of maybe agree that it, it's trending in the wrong direction, but um, that's not the question. The question was four and one, and I don't know how you can come away with whatever you want to say, but the sentiment being fool's goal, like they probably were not as good as their record indicated. More importantly, they were not going to be able to stay as good as the record indicated playing the way they were playing. I don't know how you got to argue that. We we raised this thing when I. I asked the question after the four and one start after the TCU game. And I said, Hey, this team is four and one, but they are basically two plays away from being two and three and pointed to last year's team that began the year. Was it two and two? Well, they were, they were two plays away from being four and oh and ranked in the top 25 going into a game against Texas. And you know, you asked me, and I said, I don't, I don't know the answer. I don't know if I'm saying this team is not as good as four and one, or last year's team was better than two and two. I, I wasn't sure which way I was going with that, but just pointing out how close things are, and maybe last year's team wasn't as bad as everyone thinks it was. Maybe this team's this year's team wasn't as good as everyone thinks it is. And I don't want to say we're trending towards the second one here, but again, this is what happens when you play a ton of games. Where I mean, one, it's the nature of college football. Like, there's typically going to be close games, but when you play to make the game close, you're putting, you know, you're putting it in these situations where just a coin flip can can decide things. And again, West Virginia is now. You could very easily make the argument West Virginia is two plays away from being, what six and one. So I'm like, I mean, you you could be in a very good spot, but you could then also make the argument that they're two plays away from being two games worse than what they are right now and just being one of the worst teams in the entire country. So it is what it is with this team and and how tight the games are so far. Yeah, I agree. Um, Summit WVU asks, if you are average or below average at everything, this is what you get. What are we good at? Mike, can you pick one thing? I feel like pass protection has been pretty good. Probably doesn't get a lot of attention. And green helps with that too, but um, I, I would go to this and it's hard to give the offense credit for stuff because it's not gone the way they wanted. And there's a whole bunch of explanations, but I think you'd feel, you'd feel heartened knowing that they've added a couple of things the past few weeks and those have worked. And then the more you add, the playbook's only going to hold so many plays. So you're probably getting rid of some stuff, some players, some plays, whatever. And that might, make the offense sustainable if you want to keep using that word. Like if it has been good and you wonder, can they keep it going? Yeah, maybe the point and the productivity is not identical going forward, but if they're adding good stuff and they're finding ways to get good players in the field and to use them, and that happens a couple weeks in a row, that's good. But it's also going to weed out some of the bad stuff. So I think that's good. I think their additions on offense have been have been good, and I think their pass protection has been okay. I just I have a hard time – being definitive on defense because that's in such a state of flux right now. And I just I just can't continue to give them ribbons for saying they play hard, which they do. That comes up like almost every time you talk about West Virginia to opponents or people who watch them. And that that matters, but that's going to be tested for sure. All right, Mike. I'm not sure. I, I hate to break everybody's spirit or, you know, if you were hoping to hear your name called on the podcast, but 47 different questions, some variation of, is it time? What are Chris and Mike's thoughts on this situation? Is it salvageable? Is there a scenario where the season can be saved and he keeps his job? Is there any way to keep the fans happy and the donors happy to make this happen? Mike, 
take it whichever way you wish to go here because it's a pretty open discussion with a lot of different angles that people are asking about. Yeah, so the the simplest thing is that, yeah, he's got opportunities, and but he can do whatever he can do with them. It could be good. It could be bad. He's got five games left. He's got to go – X and X, and I don't have the answers for that. I just, I just don't know what seven and five does for you. And perhaps smarter people with deeper pockets and keys, offices that I do not have, can explain that to me. But what does seven and five get you? Um, five Big Twelve wins, I guess, for the first time. That's good, but it gives you a bowl game. I don't know if that really matters as much anymore, considering the, the quantity of them. But if you miss one, and then you improve your win total by two in the next year, that might do it. But I just think you have to step back and look at the schedule and say you were four and one and you finished seven and five. That's not great because ultimately it's about where you are in the Big 12. It just is. And if you're not winning Big 12 games against teams that you should, that's difficult. And these are certainly two that if you clean up against like some of the bottom teams, that's fine. But to really make a move, you're going to have to clear the middle. And they didn't Um, if because Houston and Oklahoma State are probably middle teams. Oklahoma State may be in Dallas. I don't know. We'll see. But they just kind of profile as middle of the pack teams, the Big 12, and they couldn't get over that hump. So that's bad. The The thing about that, though, is that it's hard to get rid of a coach who has a winning record, who improved his win total by two, who got you to a bowl game, and who does a lot of the the good stuff off the field that a program should stand for. So that's that's a really complex conversation. Where the resistance probably increases, though, about making a change and, and kind of drawing lines, it's like, well, what happens if he goes eight and four? I cannot see a world, Chris, in which they improve by three, win six Big 12 games, and more importantly right now, finish four and one and make a change. I just, that doesn't seem like a thing that West Virginia is going to do. So can he? Yeah. Will he? Who knows? It's really hard to, to figure out this team's personality, except that this is a team that has finished strongly, and and you could manipulate the definition and the, and the strength of the word strongly. Um, however you want, but has won some games at the end of the seasons last year, first year in between too, that made things more interesting or salvage seasons, seasons or maybe even jobs. But if that happens again, what are you doing? Because you've already done it a couple times. Are you doing this just to reload and ask the same questions again next year? But is is that familiarity, that pattern, is that the ammunition to make change? I feel like you would need more than that. And I don't know where that would be. Like, we have to make a change because we keep doing this. That sounds good, but, like, you're going to have to be more compelling than that, I think. And you're not going to have that type of motivation if they go 4-1 and one at the end. So, can he? Yeah, absolutely. He can save his job. What will it take? He's probably going to have to fall on his face and make it no argument. But somebody wrote a story last year saying that he'd made the hard part easy with some one-sided losses and some teams that weren't prepared and just some untimely performances. I don't know who that was. But, like, he's still here. <laughs> so even the hard stuff, the hard decisions that he makes easy sometimes with performances or records or just stuff that you look at on the surface and are obvious, it doesn't really matter because it's a much deeper conversation, um, evaluation, all that stuff. But that evaluation probably should be complete. It's going to be about a year. Um, of on the ground, in the locker room, with the team at practice, hands on the product evaluation. I don't think that needs more time. So I think whatever decision they make, it will be informed and pretty thorough too. I'm with you. Uh, first, just a quick rundown of the finishes, just for those wondering about with your comment about how they have a history of finishing strong. 2019 won two of their final three. Uh, Neil Brown's first year when they were underdogs in all three of those games. 2020. Won two of their final three, including the bowl game. 2021, won their final two regular season games, including over Texas, to get bowl eligible. 2022, won two of their final three games when they were underdogs in all, all three of those games. So it is possible. It has happened. Uh, you know, those teams weren't exactly world beaters. People weren't exactly confident in those teams being good. So it is possible for you to look at this team and be like, yeah, they went, they won three of their last four. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, they're seven and five or eight and four. I don't think it's realistic, but it's happened. Like, we, I didn't think it was realistic for West Virginia to win some of those games last year or the year before. So it, it is possible to happen. But back to the bigger picture of Neil Brown, his future. I'm with you. I was with you last year when you wrote that story or that anonymous 
author wrote that story. <laughs> um, I said, you know, if, if, if it were me, I would have made the decision to move, move on. Cause again, I think that it, it feels like there's pieces here, but it's just not happening. And, and I asked you the question, I think in the preseason, how many teams in this day and age are going to go into year five, maybe year six, like, you know, are going to go into, excuse me, going to go into year six with a coach. How many power five teams are going to go into year six of a coach who is under 500? How many? It's like, it's pretty small list. Yeah. And is West Virginia part of that really small list? It shouldn't be. The fans don't want it to be. The donors don't want it to be. So why is there being an exception being made here? Um, and the other part of this is in, in – in how you work to fix problems in college football, there are, you know, obviously what, why is this happening? Why can the offense not get going? And you make the changes at offensive coordinator. Well, you know what? Blamed one offensive coordinator, pushed it to another one, pushed it to another one, changed to another one. And it all kind of circles back to Neil Brown. Again, the offense turned it around the last couple of games. So maybe that's not the problem. Then you get to the defense. It was good. Then it was bad. Then it was good again. Now it's gotten worse somehow. But have we seen West Virginia fire a coordinator? Have we seen them push out assistant coaches? Like, I mean, I know after that first year, you know, when Xavier Dye left for UCF, like, it was one of those, hey, oh, man, shucks. See you later kind of situations. Uh, but when has West Virginia made changes to the staff to try to fix problems? I well, one that, when has West – when has West Virginia done it and been like honest about it? Yeah. Cause we had that whole Kirk Soraka debacle right. a couple of years ago. And then last year, like it's, it's pretty clear that Graham Harrell was an offensive coordinator for the final, maybe half of the season too, but we never really knew about that. I think it took a, a JT Daniels story um, in, in one of the Houston papers or websites to say that it changed in the second half of the season. I'm pretty sure Harrell was on the record saying that too. So it's happened before, but it's been very quiet. Um, and the bigger deal here is that Brown really doubled down on the staff. I don't know if he couldn't or wouldn't make changes. It's probably a little bit of each, maybe more of one than the other. But I think that's on the offensive end. Like, he definitely had some some misfirings on the coordinator search, and it ended the way it did. But it was pretty adamant about the defense being better than last year was. And, it's again, it's it's hard to say that he was right about that right now. Trouble is, like, who in the house or what in the house is going to change that? I know that Jeff Castile – is an analyst on the roster right now, but I don't know how you can expect him to come in and just turn back the clock to when he was humming a long time ago and make it work again. That's that's a, a really hard expectation there. And you're not in a you're not in a spot right now where you can roll the dice and hope something like obtuse works when they tried the obtuse, which was to run it back with the same coaches, and that didn't work either, too. Um I, I don't want to whittle it down to too fine of a point. Um like they're they're underdogs on the road against UCF, which is kind of bizarre because UCF is 0 and 4 in the Big 12. Started 3 and 0, is 0 and 4. That's a bad look. But if you lose that one, okay, that's fine. Better not lose to BYU at home, which is a weird thing. Is BYU is 5 and 2, but narrow wins, not the best schedule. Have lost to some you know, the teams that have a pulse that they have they played. Like they beat Sam Houston State 14 nothing. They beat Southern Utah. They beat Arkansas. Lost to Kansas. Beat Cincinnati, which is two and five. Uh, got smoked by TCU and beat Texas Tech, which is having some issues right now too. So they're five and two. But that's four and zero oh at home. Uh, when they go on the road, they're one and two, and their win is at Arkansas. So not the best resume right there. I think if they if they find themselves a game under five hundred with four straight losses, and and that's going to be at home, that's a bad look. I don't. That would be a worry, a worrisome morning for uh, yours truly trying to fit in all my Sunday work and, and what could happen. Rick, let's fast forward to a week before Thanksgiving. It's a four and six West Virginia team, fresh off five straight losses, facing a two and eight Cincinnati team, fresh off eight straight losses. One, is that realistic? Two, if it is realistic, are there 25,000 fans in the stands? <laughs> it depends on how many people like empty their pockets to pay for the banner that they tug behind the airplane above the stadium. 
So maybe they can't afford tickets after that. Look, if they lose to UCF and BYU, that's trouble because then you're going to Oklahoma. And the reason I believe in midseason coaching changes is because I, I don't think you put an interim staff in place to go to Oklahoma. Um, and I, I don't think you, it's just hard to get those guys a, like a chance. Like we might have a chance to keep the job. And then also, who on the staff are you elevating? That's why I don't believe in it. But to your point, is that possible? And yeah, because I, I don't think they're going to make the change. I think they could absolutely lose the next two games and maybe the three. But that's, I think the BYU game is certainly winnable with a team coming to the East that hasn't been that great, kind of has a strange record. And, if they don't, man, Oklahoma, how do you pick West Virginia on the road against Oklahoma? That'd be a hard one to do. So then you're looking at a wildly unexpected season for a team that's been here for north of a decade versus a team that's new to the Big 12 and hasn't adjusted. I, I would think it's got to hit 30,000, Chris, right? Because <laughs> like season tickets are, you know, like two dozen, like 24,000 friends, family, so marching band. They're going to pull a pit and just say tickets sold, bounces. Yeah. actual attendance in this one and say Cincinnati 30. was one of the mini packages too right oh I think it was so, I think it was yeah so it was Oklahoma State and there was only 51,000 for that so would it be smaller than that yeah I would say 30 would be my my over under if that if what you're saying is true I think you could probably set 30 as an interesting over under 25 is pretty 25 is like class 5a Texas high school football yeah, well let me ask you this then that's going to bring us to the next question because I've seen people bring up, you know, oh, hey, if you lose this many season tickets, um, season ticket holders, if you lose this many people in attendance, it's going to cost the university this much, which costs the town this much, which costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is money an issue here with this situation with Neil Brown? Well, the buyout was zero dollars. Are we having this conversation? Probably not. We're talk- We're probably talking about how a first year coach is doing, right? I think. I think that's an honest conversation you can have. Maybe right, maybe wrong, but a lot of people n- would would have you believe that the the weight of that buyout last year would was hard to move on from. Some money mattered there. Why wouldn't it matter somewhere else, especially in the financial straits that the university is in? I know the money comes in different pockets when it comes to academics and athletics, but still. Looks are looks. And if you're $75 million in debt and you're scratching $12 million checks to get rid of a coach, plus a couple more million to get rid of the assistant coaches and all that, and there's going to be some more money that, that comes in that, it's going to look bad. And there might be people who make those checks possible. They might give you money. They might be your benefactors. But why can't they help the business school, the forensic department, whatever? So there's there's just complicated things like that that some people seek to avoid when it comes to those moments. But the truth is that the money does matter. But Chris, they get dozens of millions of dollars for just being in the Big 12. The difference between one crowd or two crowds with 40,000 and 60,000 is not much. It just isn't. And like they haven't been robust when it comes to season ticket sales for a long, long time. It's been flat for like a decade. Um, Are you spiking it by hiring some up and coming coordinator or are you sinking it by bringing the coaching staff back another year, you're probably going to be about flat again. That's the truth. Just like the fan passion or energy hasn't been like that for a while. And who or what is the identity of the person who's going to change that? It's just wins. Someone's got to win. That's going to take time, whether it's this staff or another staff too. So the only way you're raising the attendance, I think, um, is getting winning seasons in a row. That's going to take time, obviously. I'm not sure there's a hire out there that makes people say, I got to get season tickets. And that number jumps from like 24 to 32,000. Just don't know about that. I might be wrong. There might be that juice out there for somebody, but um, money does matter. I just don't think it's just like this inevitable force that you can't ignore because I think that there's certainly ways around that right now or to rationalize it. Yeah. Here, one last question before we get to our, our outro here. Uh, this one from MS Smith, and I'll give you anywhere between one second and 30 seconds to answer this question. If you had to choose only one, what is the primary cause of our issues, talent or coaching? Coaching. I, d- I just think it's more than calling plays and 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 like it's game plans, it's it's practice habits, it's having the right people in the right spots in the depth chart or the right position, it's recruiting, it's development. Um, talent's not great, but coaching certainly that would that, I think you could fix a lot of this with coaching. Oh, um, we sort of disagree. Talent and managerial skills. 
I guess is what we're getting at here. Because a bit of each, right? Right. Because it, it, the reason the talent isn't where it should be is because of the coaching, because of, of of who's bringing it in. So I think talent is the problem. There needs to be more talent on there. They are. We talked about the the defense, and I said they were playing a dangerous game. And you and I talked about that already in the post game pod from Oklahoma State. But they're out there running a defense like they have Rasul Douglas and you know Carl Joseph and those guys in the secondary and they don't they just don't and so then that goes back to coaching like why why are these guys here why are these your best options and then to your point why are you not changing your scheme around to better suit the talent that you did bring in um stuff again like everything it's a little bit of everything but myth wanted it straight and narrow before we get to the outro, one last thing. I wanted to adjust my stats for the losing and the win tied situations. I took out the Duquesne game entirely because I I, re- I realized, hey, wait, I took it out for the rushing, but not the passing. That's dumb. And it gets really hairy. So the rushing's the same, obviously, since I already took Duquesne out. But the passing, if you take Duquesne out, this is WVU versus FBS opponents. Win losing. Same, basically the same stats. I think they had one, it was like one for four with a touchdown when they were losing against Duquesne. But now, and so 829 yards, five TDs, one interception with a QB rating of 145 still. When West Virginia is winning or tied with an FBS opponent, they have 274 passing yards, one touchdown, three interceptions, and a QB rating of 87. Ooh. Hmm. Mm. Mm. Seems telling. Mm. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, perhaps that's on the agenda for today. Uh, Neil Brown news conference noon. Oh, sorry, one p.m. Uh, an unknown number of players with unknown identities at noon. Brown at one. Over straw. Oh, coordinators. Maybe we get a for the third straight week. Ed Best Aaron in. Don't think he showed up on film, so that's probably not going to happen. Anyhow, players, coaches, coordinators. As we get ready for um. Saturday, Magic Kingdom, bounce house, UCF, three and four, six and a half point favorites at home against West Virginia. Noon game, Chris, we like that one. Anything else of note coming up on the side here? I'm going to have a midweek recruiting update. Uh, waiting to hear on the battle waiver still as of the time we're recording this Monday morning. Once that comes down, the Year Sports basketball preview is coming. Um, but I noted it on the board. The Perez situation, that might have changed one game for me. An adult situation that could change several games for me. So it's important. Wonder what's going on there. When they got denied and they're at the waiver stage yet, I'm I'm they're a week behind West Virginia's expected delivery. More than that by now. They thought I would have it before the secret scrimmage, which was um this not not Saturday a couple of days ago, but the week before. And they have a scrimmage, excuse me, charity exhibition Friday. So time is clicking. Ticking, I guess. Something else is clicking. Maybe it's me. That'll wrap it up. Plenty to discuss here. If you haven't seen, if you haven't heard the answer to the question that you asked, check out Chris's written explanation in the mailbag form coming up here um, sometime later on the site. We'll have the Neil Brown Player Coordinator News Conference covered, and then all of our regular tricks up our sleeve for the remainder of the week. Until then, I'm Mike Kazazin. I'm Chris Anderson. Talk to you then.